Yes, people, welcome back to episode 69 of the Catabolic Window podcast. Jack's going to be off. Yeah, actually, is, mate. <laughs> We've got Ollie from Vide Fitness on the podcast today. We just had a bit of debate about how to say the name, but it is Vide. We've got it. It's all good. Mate, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah. How are you both? Pretty good, pretty good. Stress revising for exams, but it is what it is. Yeah, mate, you got to get those. Uh, you got to get those grades. Um, so for the, for the people at home, because Luke, you are good mates with Ollie here, um, and this is the first time that we've we've interacted at all. So if, Ollie, if you want to give a bit of an introduction into what Vide is, your background, kind of promote a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So. Um... I suppose Vide Fitness initially was um, the kind of online coaching umbrella mm-hmm. um, brand. And then I've since focused mainly on personal training. So then I now have Vide Fitness is kind of just my personal Instagram account, which I've left that way. And now the brand has become Vide Personal Training, which um, obviously is the personal side of it. So Vide Fitness really is the online coaching side of the business. Um, but it's kind of a bit of a mismatch between the two at the moment. Um, my my background, if I go kind of way back, um, I actually studied um, physics at university. Um, I, I, my background wasn't in personal training at that point. Um, I always went to the gym as soon as I was old enough to do so. Um, but I worked as a lifeguard at the local leisure centre whilst I was at university and also trained at the gym. Um, and when I got to the end of the university, it kind of became clear to me that I firstly probably wouldn't have been good enough at maths to actually have been a decent <laughs> physicist. Um, but also it wasn't where my interests lay. You know, I, I would much rather have gone to the gym and also spoken to people. I, I like being social and talking and there isn't a massive amount of that when you are doing calculations on MATLAB on the computer. So um, I then worked full time at the leisure centre whilst I was trying to think what I was going to do and then eventually decided that I would try and get my personal training qualifications and and go from there. So I I worked my way up in in the company at the leisure centre from uh, working as fitness instructor, you know, teaching spin classes and things like that. And I worked as a personal trainer for that company as well and then into management. And then uh, lockdown happened and I then uh, started doing online coaching as pretty much everyone else did. But it was more out of necessity rather than that's what I wanted to do or whether, you know, that was I was trying to make more money that way or anything like that. It was more that the PT clients that I had, I would, you know, I'm trying to keep them making as much progress as possible. So um I would write them plans and, you know, ring them and speak to them about that. And that's where the online coaching came. But as soon as we were able to kind of meet in public again, um, I would endeavor to train those people in the park. And I used to take equipment in the boot of my car and go to the park. And it was always one-to-one. I never did boot camps. I've never been interested in anything like that. Um, And I would literally just train them in the park. And so we did that until... um, a one day it was absolutely chucking it down and i my my grandma lives quite nearby where the park was and i said look um you know could i go into your garage and do the session in your garage she doesn't drive there's nothing in the garage um just so that we're sheltered and you know started doing that and then i thought well actually you know we don't have to worry whether it's raining or not we can just go into the garage and that's kind of how the personal training side of vibe personal training started is just me training those clients um in my grandma's garage because it was dry and it was better than being at the park and then before before long i'd filled her garage with equipment i had a leg press in there i had a um <laughs> pre-core cable stack, um, you know, wow. uh, racks, things like that. And I outgrew that and then obviously needed somewhere better. And then um, I found a, a property literally down the road. It's literally down the road from my grandma's garage um, that I, I've now moved that into today. And that's kind of without going, you know, talking all night where I'm at at the moment. Mate, that's class. So you've got a real, I'm going to say rags to riches kind of story from uh from starting off well not only instructing like uh like classes but like 
doing uh, doing PT sessions out your your grandma's garage is impressive, mate. Especially if you've got like a leg press and a pre core cable in there, that is impressive. Do you have any pictures of the gym when it was back in the garage out of reference? Because I really want to see that. Uh, yes, I will oh, do. Oh, mate, I've got to see this. I've got to see a leg press in a garage. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I painted it all black and had mirrors in there and stuff. It looked it looked quite good. It was just obviously not huge. Um, is online coaching so studio one point was in the garage. And now you're in two point oh. Yeah. So the, the funny thing is, actually, um, I know we'll touch on this a little bit more later. Um, I did my entire bodybuilding prep out of my grandma's garage. <laughs> Damn. And For they, sure. you know, when they, they announce which gym you train at before yeah. you go out on stage and they announce that I trained at my grandma's garage. So <laughs> that's what they said word for word. No, no. They said, um, I, they probably said Vidi actually, the Vidi fitness or something like that, that I train out of, but I knew that that was my grandma's garage. <laughs> um, so it was, um, the way that you kind of talked about things, it was PT and working, a personally in one to one and it was kind of always the goal is online yeah. coaching kind of more of a um being able to branch out and work with with people in different countries and is personal training kind of more your passion or, or would you say they're kind of even footing or one's ahead of the other yeah i mean they it's not they that i i it's not that i view that personal training is, is better than online coaching because they have different purposes mm. so i do i do still online coach i do have clients online coaching but um, to be honest, I don't have any online clients who are within travel dis reasonable travel distance of the gym. Anybody who lives within half an hour of the gym will come down at least once a month, mm. even if it's just for it. Right. Let's check, you know, your technique intensity, things like that in person. And, um, you know, quite a few clients do that. They just come down once a month and then, you know, they're usually the people who are, they've been training a long time. They know what they're doing. They don't necessarily need the physical accountability, mm. but they could do with a little bit of a tune up with me in person once a month. And aside from that, the people who I train purely online, they're just too far away. Um, I've got a, a few clients who live in um, Texas. They are English. They are English. They're not American. Mate, I reckon they could make the trip. They just don't <laughs> want it bad enough. Well, one of them has. One of them has once, but it was only because they were coming back to visit family in the UK. Um, and yeah, so it's no, more a case coming to of, see you, really. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's more a case of necessity, um, location, and you know if they specifically want me to help them, but they're too far away to come down to the gym, then I will do the best I can with them. But it's just less what I'm passionate about because you spend more time at a computer mm. and I really like to be literally there next to the person. Just tweet, you know, move your foot that much. And yes, you can take form videos and you can give them feedback, and but it does take time. You know, you're not always literally live in the gym. Whereas if I say, right, move your knee to there, how does that feel? Straight away, they can give you that feedback and then you can use that. And that's more, I really love having that attention to detail that I just really struggle to do via purely online. 100%. Yeah, you can try like five different things to do in a session and, mm -hmm. and get pretty close to what's going to work best in a one-off, whereas that's going to take us five weeks of going back and forth over messages and form videos, and then one day they forget the form videos and all of that. So it, it can take a little while. I completely get what you mean. And that's like one of the things that we wanted to speak to you about was there's this whole thing in the industry of like, being a PT is fucking awful. Like, why would you ever want to be a PT? And online is where it's at. But it sounds like you you really fucking enjoy it, which is obviously obviously good. So what are the the benefits you see to PT for, for you personally and, then, and for, like, people training? So I think first and foremost, it's the thing that I enjoy doing. I love being in the gym and I love with working people, working with people face to face. And I value that over potentially the ability to earn a little bit more money. Um, you know, as long as I am comfortable, then I then value above that what I enjoy doing day to day rather than I could earn a little bit more money, but I'm sat at a computer all day. And it's, it's great saying, you know, you can live in Bali or Dubai and do that job, but it doesn't matter where you are in the world if you're stuck at a computer when you'd rather be in the gym. So um, yeah, they say you can work anywhere, but what they don't tell you is that you're working everywhere. 
exactly yeah. yeah um so i think that's the main reason but what that's transpired into and i think that's partly how i am as a person um and now uh dom who is the uh, another personal trainer that we've got working for me um is that most people we train are injured and that isn't as a result of us training them poorly um <laughs> like this fell through but it it's a combination of we get sent direct referrals from physios, um, but also we've now got a bit of a reputation of being the people to see if you're too broken to go to a bog standard personal trainer. And those kinds of people, I just I really struggle to see how you'd be able to train them online because you need to, assess, you know, we're talking centimeter differences in range of motion can make the difference between it being safe and effective and them. Um, you know, aggravating a meniscus tear that they've had or and things like that. And, it, you know, to a point where so we now have um, an in-house physio that can do bridging appointments with clients. So, for example, you know, someone has a knee replacement and they have physio either on, on the NHS or privately, and they get to a point where the physio goes, right, you would now benefit from strengthening up that knee. Um, it might be slightly too early to then just go to a personal trainer and be like right you know we're going to start doing squats whereas we can have sessions with the physio in the gym and the physio can say right this is what's appropriate we're all present and then we can build on that and again that's something that i just don't think you could do effectively online um, and that really helps people and i get more satisfaction from that as well because from a business perspective you end up getting people with more reasonable expectations so your client turnover is a lot slower we rarely lose clients because people do it to have better quality of life rather than to get an end result or you know to drop body fat or anything like that so um you know the vast majority of clients we train want to be able to go walking when they're on holiday um and things like that you know get in and out of cars pain free is not you know, I, I'm into kind of bodybuilding and things like that, yeah, but yeah. the vast, vast majority of people I train are, you know, not interested at all. And actually it scares them the thought that they're going to grow bigger muscles. <laughs> is that one that you still encounter uh, to this day? That must be, uh, is that a fun conversation or do you find that a little bit irritating? I think less so nowadays. I think it's it's not that people are, aren't as worried it, because you know they they don't think that they're going to get bigger i think it's just slightly more acceptable we're usually talking about women here where yeah, yeah, yeah. you know they, they're worried about getting too big but i don't i don't think women are scared of being muscular as much as they used to be anymore mm. so i don't one i don't think that's a worry because people don't mind if they they're muscly um but no, it's not a conversation that bothers me at all, because if somebody has, you know, I will have the same conversations about yeah. certain things again and again and again. You know, I've I've had a conversation this week with three different clients that they're worried that the hair's going to fall out if they take creatine. And it's, you know, oh, stuff for good. us. Yeah, exactly. That's for crazy. us, that that is, you know, well, we we heard about that years ago and yeah. we don't even think about that anymore. But for a lot of people, it's genuinely something that they're worried about. Um, and I never worry, it doesn't matter how many times I have the conversation, because to them, that's the first time they've ever been told that information. Yeah. And I, I like knowing that then you've really helped them with that. Have you, do you guys have any kind of um, like an FAQ or anything for new clients to kind of cover off maybe a few fitness myths um, that you kind of com commonly see brought up? Uh, no, but that is something that would really benefit. Um, I'm not great with kind of the the back end side of, you know, ebooks and you know when people sign up, they get given like uh, welcome packs and things like that. Um, it partly because I just don't like sitting at a computer, so the more I can avoid that, the better. I'd rather just have a conversation with somebody if I can. And I would just go through everything that they need to go through. I'm usually quite a good judge of what's an appropriate amount of information to give somebody. Yeah. Um, so we don't really have anything like that. Um, but I think probably a middle grounds, you know, it, it would be nice to have the resource available. Yeah. So I no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of worth, I think if you're having a lot of like 
repeated conversation. I mean, it depends who you like your clientele are. Like if they're not going to be the most tech savvy, then obviously it's not worth it. But even if in your first session, you just handed them a leaflet or something out of interest though, what are, cause I'm curious now, cause obviously the, the uh, creatine one and the muscular muscularity one are very, very old kind of like fitness myths. What are the most common ones you hear out of interest? Um, yeah, that's, that's a difficult one, really. I, I suppose um, the the thing that I shut down the most often mm -hmm. is when people who are not beginners anymore, but they're going to sort of more towards being an intermediate, that they then think that they are more advanced than they are. And they 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 have a, com you know, they've been in a, a, a muscle building phase for, you know, the last sort of three months mm -hmm. and they suddenly decide that they want to step it up a gear and they want to get bigger mm -hmm. and they this is their words by the way yeah, yeah, and yeah. they they okay should we now start having you know like a chest day or a, a back day and split it up that way oh. and it's that realization that from their point of view they thought that the full body sessions i'd given them were kind of an easing them in mm. And, and actually that wasn't the the best and it, obviously partly on me that I haven't given them the the appropriate information that they should have had but they don't think that that's the fastest way for them to make progress and they think that I'm just kind of giving them a little bit less because they're a beginner and actually once they're ready like gatekeeping they would, sort of they thing, would benefit yeah. more from that. and it's then me trying to explain to them that they have a a minimum effective volume and a maximum tolerable dose of resistance training and if you can give them that maximum tolerable dose within a full body session and or minimum effective volume within a full body session and then repeat that three times that's going to get them better if not the same amount of progress as doing that entire volume in one session and it's that realization for them that they thought that I mean, it makes sense you know more advanced bigger bodybuilders train like that so therefore if you want to look like that copy them um, and that's probably the thing most often that I'm explaining people is the concept of volume split across an entire week rather than, you know, it's better to have all that in one session. Yeah. I don't know about the last time that you two did like a full body session, but I probably did what I think it was in December that I did one with the PT project guys and I was fucked. Yeah. They are horrid. Like if you absolutely yeah. fucked. Cause when, like when you, they, they can be brutal because you're literally training everything. Yeah. Yeah. I always say there's two things that usually become your limiting factor. Number one is, is time. How long yeah. are you able to spend in the gym for most people? You know, the maximum is an hour that they're prepared, prepared to be in there. It's all right if you do it for a living and you can spend hours in there. But I think people don't appreciate that. Most of the general public have a maximum of an hour. So if you, if you, can't get in all of the appropriate amounts of volume for different muscles within that hour well then that's a case for then splitting that session into two different sessions um the other thing is the energy levels you know as you've just said mm -hmm. if you get to a point where in order to keep making progress in order to keep the right amount of volume in a session that by the time you get into the end of it you're just half arsing things because you're absolutely dead then that's again another case for splitting it up. But they they are problems that you need to encounter before you decide to do it. Whereas people don't look at that as a solution to those problems. They look forwards. You know, okay, well if I change this, then I'll start growing. And but they've not yet encountered the limitation that then they would benefit from doing that. Yeah, I get what you mean. I think there's and I definitely fell into this like a couple of years ago of a lot of people think they're more advanced than they are yeah and really start it's a it's a buzzword at this point but over complicating things for the for the level of advancement that they are at and it's it you need to be able to sort of scale back and approach that and see like okay actually what's going on and what really matters for for you to to deal with is that something that you ran into at one point as well is that with myself or with clients um I, yeah, I meant you personally, but I I can see why some people might apply it to their clients as well. Like, okay, does does my fifty four year old client with a dodgy knee really need to be doing a triple drop set on the fucking leg press or some shit like that? <laughs> you know. 
let's not kill them. <laughs> yeah, so people like that sort of person that you just described don't tend to, you know, they have no thoughts about what they should or shouldn't be doing, and they are completely open to just, you know, I'm the person who knows what I'm talking about in that situation, and they're just like, yeah, you tell me what's appropriate. The people who you have to kind of constantly restrain are the people who are, you know, younger they've been training for a couple of years they have primarily um you know, physique related goals and they are the ones who then just you know three months they think they've gone from intermediate to advanced because they've lot watched a lot of youtube or tiktok videos in that three months and then they think that they're then at that that point and to be perfectly honest i i fall into that category i know that i think that i'm more advanced than i am I think it's an easy trap to fall into, though, when you're for a living. I'm, I'm sure we're, all three of us are probably guilty of that to an extent, because for a living, we're telling other people what to do. So it's hard to not view yourself as more advanced in terms of, I guess, physicality or physiology, because you're telling people what they should and shouldn't be doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I, I reason that for myself as that I have all the time in the world to train. I have a private gym that I can train in and I enjoy training like that. So I don't think there's any real detriment to me training like I'm more advanced than I am, if that's the way that I enjoy it. I prefer to split up workouts so that I can train pretty much every day versus I could get away with three full, full body workouts a week and probably still make progress. But I also want to enjoy going to the gym as well. And Absolutely. so therefore I, I take that yeah, like if you complicate it more to an extent, like you are going to make more progress as long as you're doing it right, so to speak. The the definition that I really like of advanced is like how how much do you have to nail in order to make progress? And the more shit that you can't get away with, the, the more advanced I think you are on paper. Yeah, because you get diminishing returns the further you go through it. I think that's a much better way of doing it. Most people um, look at how long they've been going years. to the gym. Yeah. And if you've been doing the wrong things for years, then you're still a beginner, but you yeah. think that you are advanced. And that's kind of the worst combination is people who are completely set in their ways, um, but think that they know best because they've been training for so long. I've run into a few of them in my Instagram comment section this week. Oh, it's been yeah. great. We had one of those in Luke's, Luke's Instagram. Oh, geez. I think the, the, the biggest issue that a lot of people have and, um, you know, it's it's still it, it's um, it's it's easy to understand because the process is very slow. I think people are you know making good progress. They might not not necessarily be able to recognize that they're making good progress, or they're hungry for more. So their thought process is okay. Something needs to change. So then they start looking for those changes, and I think that's when you get people going. Okay, well, I've been on full body for a while, so. And I see the the you know the pros at the top are doing bro splits, so maybe I should hit up Ollie and say, look, it's time to change something, and they're kind of expecting to go from here to here, you know. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think frustration sets in at some point because your expectations exceed the reality of the progress that you're making, and it's only natural to then look for ways that you can accelerate that progress. And most people come to the conclusion of. They need to add something or do something more and then that will solve that issue and it also gives them comfort in that frustration because they feel like they've then made a change that is going to then start to help them it's you know muscle building is so slow that it i don't really think that anyone truly knows that they're doing the right thing that the perfect thing and you know you, you can talk about you know different exercises and obviously there is some research to support certain things but they're very limited in themselves um and it's difficult really to truly know that you're doing the right thing but if you're getting some form of measurable progress it's probably all you can really hope for you know because you don't know that that amount of progress could be better or could be worse and if you keep changing things then you've never got that data the strong data to support whether you know how effective what you've done is you see it all the time of like, oh, yeah, I've been bulking for two weeks. I'm not massive, so, but I'm feeling a bit fat, so I'm going to cut <laughs> and then just go around in circles. Yeah. 
you notice a difference in expectations between the people that come to you in person and like come to you online in terms of like the, the results that they're looking to get? I know you kind of alluded to that a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, so I think from me speaking to people, um, I find, I don't know whether you guys have found this as well, but I find that people tend to play down what their kind of goals are because I think they probably don't want to fail or they don't want to let themselves down. So they usually come in at, you know, I, I want to lose a stone or, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily want to focus too much on on weight loss or something um but I, I want to feel a bit fitter and it's then they don't necessarily need to be accountable to what they really want and as soon as they get into it they then actually i'd quite like to do that you know I, i've got uh, quite a few clients who choose not to do progress photos you know they they don't want to do that at all um and then we get a few months in and they start to see progress and then they decide okay, no, now actually I do want to do that because then they start to believe that they're going to make the progress they want to make. But initially they don't, they don't really want to commit to doing that. And then they, they wish they had, you know, later down the line. This is in person, by the way, I, you can't coach people online without being able to see them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a very good point, to be fair. I know exactly what Jack's going to say here, but please go on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you do know what I'm going to say. I think the the whole thing about um, like client expectations uh, it is quite an interesting one. I think because um, me and Luke are, ourselves are kind of um, in in the the kind of content that we put out is much more bodybuilding focused. I'm making an assumption there based off the fact that it's called Vired Fitness, right? Is it the content that you put out? Is I know that you're obviously you, you're bodybuilding currently and you've prepped before, but is the content that you put out kind of more aimed towards who you tend to work with, or is it still quite kind of bodybuildery for the online stuff that is? To be honest with my content, it's a lot of things that I'm interested in. I don't really do a lot of targeted marketing for online. The vast majority of my business is nothing to do with Instagram. You know, I, I could delete my Instagram account, today and it would make no difference to my to my business so really then rather than putting out a load of content and putting effort into that content that would help me get clients it's different if it's online my my demographic really is people that live within 20 minutes of where the gym is mm. and it's far easier to market towards that because all you need to do is to be known in your local area so things like facebook groups are way better for things like that rather than putting out a you know how to figure out your macros on on instagram yeah, so yeah. my my instagram generally is just my own workouts little thoughts that i have about things which are usually you know biomechanics maybe a bit of bodybuilding sort of thing um, but i don't think too much about i'm trying to attract this type of person i think generally i i have followers who are just like-minded like yourselves um because it's the things I'm interested in are also interesting to you guys, but I don't target it towards anybody. So it's slightly different in that sense. Fair enough. I, I think, yeah, because um, me and Luke are more kind of like, because we, we've, uh, well, Luke's prepped before, I haven't, but we're kind of always talking about bodybuilding and prep and kind of specializing more so in muscle growth. I think I'd say I don't really come across the same kind of uh, clients, I guess, um, underplaying goals when they're p perhaps like like you kind of alluded to where you know oh i want to lose a stone but secretly if you could wave a wand and make them lose three or four they'd be happy um, yeah i think usually for me in my experience it's kind of the other way like you run into someone who's very much into like the bodybuilding lifestyle but still enjoying balance but they'll talk a lot about competing and you know kind of saying like oh i, I might compete one day i might compete one day and it's sort of like they're almost it's something that they're mulling over in their head, but it's not necessarily something that you think they'll do just based off their own actions. I'm not sure if it, if it's the same for you, Luke, but competition do does often kind of arise or, or photo shoot preps or stuff like that does arise a lot, particularly with like even lifestyle physique clients. This is the rabbit hole I thought you were going to go down earlier. I thought you were going to say your usual thing about like, even if you don't send me the progress pictures, please just take them for yourself at the start because in three months you'll be kicking yourself that you didn't take them. I almost get a little bit nervous when I'm speaking to someone and they're 
talking about all of the big goals that they have, because a lot of the time I tend to see that the people that talk the most about it are the worst at actually doing the work to get there. So when I hear all of that, it's almost like a little bit of a red flag to me sometimes. Do you, yeah. get, do you get what I mean? Yeah, mate, a hundred percent. I think like the, the, one of the key, like, um, I'll, I'll let Ollie scooch in here as the guest in a second, but one of like the key, <laughs> the key, um, like roles as a coach, obviously is to kind of set client expectation. And I think often it depend it depends on like kind of what we're talking about. I'm sure, you know, if, if you could point to a, a, an, a, a example of what a client said we might be like yeah that doesn't sound that's a bit of a red flag in what they've said there but it's often like you can tell when someone has realistic goals because they kind of comprehend the actions that take place to get to that goal if you get what i mean you know whereas if people are like if someone goes like yeah i've never dieted before but like i might do a prep that would be cool and then after the prep i might like go enhanced and do another prep and then we could go into classic and men's physique and then maybe go open and you're like if someone said that to you and they've never dieted before and they're really, they sound really enthused by it. It's like, okay, those are really lofty goals. I don't think you quite understand the actions that take place to get there. So maybe let's talk about what that means and the implications of that before we then kind of dig in and, and set those as our goals. Because I think, yeah, that's an example of a client who perhaps um, is a bit of a red flag. What, what are your thoughts, Ali? Sorry. <laughs> so to be honest, I, I've never had a client who has done anything more than a photo shoot. So I've never prepped somebody other than myself. Um, and I think just generally, because I don't necessarily put out content that's like, yeah, I'm a bodybuilding coach. You know, people generally don't come to me for that specific kind of thing. Um, I, I don't actually have that much experience with dealing with people in, you know, that have those competitive goals that come to me, you know, and say, oh, I want to do a, a competition, but I've never dieted before. In general, it'll be somebody who has always trained. They've got a little bit out of shape um, and they've gone, right, you know, can you help me get back to my best shape? And as part of that, a photo shoot at the end might be quite a nice incentive for them to stay accountable. Um, but in, in general, it's not that they've undertaken anything that, that way that they've not done before that I have to say it's inappropriate. I think on that, the usually people um, underestimate the amount of work that they're going to have to put in to get into a certain shape. So if they've never been, if they've never been like lean before, but they've got a bit out, a bit out of shape, you know, let's say they are, I, I've had this a few times where somebody is a hundred kilos and they come and they say, right, I want to, you know, get into shape. And, you know, I think uh, around 85 kilograms is where I want to be. Mm. And then I say to them, I actually think you'll be about 65 kilos by the time you're as lean as you think you're going to be. Mm. And, you know, and it's having that conversation with them that, and they, I don't think they believe you when you tell them, mm. but then they start to see it when they get to 80 kilos and they've still not got abs, you know, and, and you get to, it's that last sort of five to 10 kilos of body fat that then reveal everything underneath yeah. um the analogy i use is the the toilet paper one i don't know if yeah. you've heard of that yeah, yeah, where yeah, the, that's a good one. You, you start taking sheets off a new toilet a new toilet roll you can't see any change and then all of a sudden at the end it suddenly runs out and that's kind of how taking body fat off works you, know, you could halve the size of the toilet roll and you've still got quite a lot left yeah i've not heard that before but i, I, I quite like that one i'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna lie do you, um, I, I think kind of touching on that, you know, 100 to 85 kilo um, example, I think a lot of people underestimate perhaps the duration of time that it takes to get there. Um, you know, when people are like, oh, I want to drop 10 kilos and you, you know, put them into a diet and you might be averaging like maybe half a kilo loss and you're like, okay, well, if we keep this up as an average, this is going to be 20 weeks that we're going to be doing this to drop 10 kilos. And they're thinking it's going to be like, you know, maybe a nice six to ten sometimes depends but i'd say usually more with like lifestyle clients they kind of underestimate perhaps the duration of time it takes to kind of get somewhere in particular because you're trying to keep them comfortable as much as you can you know you don't want to just tell them to like do an hour of cardio every day and not eat all day and they're trying to spend time with their kids or whatever or family members but i think that's a very common one that i see for lifestyle yeah, definitely. Um, it and and also it's like you say, it's 
they think they'll be able to do it quite quickly, but you're saying it'll take 20 weeks. It'll take 20 weeks if every week yeah. they stick to, to the rate of loss that you... And I now account for the fact that they will not stick to the rate of loss that we've planned. Mm. So I will, every four weeks, I will assume there's one week where they, they mess up or they go on holiday or there's something where they're not accountable to it. And I'll tell them about that. I'm not saying that I'll just lie to them about the rate of loss <laughs> to account for that, but... I, you know, they, I think people are a little bit defensive at the start when I say to them, you know, right, let's just get this straight at the start. You're not going to be on it every single week. There will be weeks where you mess up, you're off plan and you're apologizing or, or whatever about that. And I know that that's going to happen. And I'm going to factor that into the rate of loss so that you don't feel guilty when that happens. Mm. Um, and obviously, if it's happening more than once every four weeks, then there's a conversation that we need to have about that. Yeah. Um but then that's that's factored into that as well. So it becomes then, okay, that's not going to take 20 weeks. It's actually going to take 30 weeks. Mm. But then we can be confident that we know the time scale because there's nothing worse than setting yourself a goal. As a, as a coach, setting your client a goal and you start to see that they're not on track to that goal and then the hill starts to get steeper and you think, how am I going to do this without really messing them up to get to still get the end result you promised them? Yeah, I think, you know, like you said, kind of um, telling people that you will mess up and that's okay is quite important. Like I always say to um, clients, uh, like at the start of a diet, be like, this is the best and, and the easiest the diet will get because it's dieting week zero. You've spent zero weeks dieting. So things are going to be at their easiest. So where you are now compared to 10 weeks in, you know, decision making might get a little bit more difficult. Like you might need to move a little bit more. You might have to eat a little bit less. And, you know, when it comes to, say, untracked events, decision making might be slightly harder because now you're not zero weeks into the diet. You're not, you know, the fattest you're going to be over the next few months. But, yeah, I think kind of setting expectations for people is, is very, very good. And particularly if you kind of uh, give people the opportunity to almost, I guess, hit or beat the timeline that you've set out, it does inspire a lot of kind of encouragement. Um, and typically, you know, that's where using things like, uh, as I'm sure you do, using incentives for like, okay, we'll try and get down to this body weight in about this time, build in a little bit of, of uh, forgiveness weeks, and then we'll have a little diet break or, you know, we'll uh, go to a short maintenance or something like that. Yeah, it depends on the person. I think if you if you coach someone for a little bit of time, then you know what kind of they respond to. Because some people are more accountable and more on it, actually, if they... You, you give them harder things to do. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, it's it, it, this kind of unrelated to diet, but it's on that same topic. So I had a client who is into running and they part of what they were training for is to do a 10K and they were improving the 10K time. And they just keep getting kind of calf, ankle injuries whilst they're running. And it, it just became apparent that the training volume that they were putting in, um, they're, they're in their, their mid-50s, um, just wasn't appropriate for they've got history of injuries and it just was causing them issues so actually the goal shouldn't be to get any faster and to just keep being able to run 10k yeah and let's just maintain that we can improve other areas of fitness and just still be able to do it and they entered a 10k race and they trained in order to just be able to do it and they said off the back of that 10k race that it was one of the hardest races that they've had even though the time wasn't fast but mentally because they weren't going for a pb in that race they were just running it for fun and they actually realized that it wasn't fun if they weren't going for something like why like they've done a 10k before it's not like the first time they've done the race and it was just it, they realized that it's harder to train mediocrely for no goal than it is to train really hard for a worthwhile goal and i think a lot of people are like that as well if you tell them right we're gonna we're going to aim for a you know one pound a week loss and a 500 calorie a day deficit they're like mm, you know and it's easy for them to overeat whereas if you tell them you're going to put them on a thousand calories a day and do loads of cardio but you're going to get results in six weeks they're really motivated for those six weeks um now obviously then there's the conversation to be had well then what happens next you know what have they done to themselves mentally and physically after that point but it's something to be considered and on an individual basis on actually is that person going to respond to a short and sweet or are they going to need that long realistic timeline yeah you're, you're right man 100 percent. i think you know uh, there, there's always those two types of people the people that want to feel like they're not dieting 
so that it's like, okay, you're just kind of living how you want over the next 30 weeks. You just happen to be dieting because I'm going to give you a few guidelines. Or like you said, I mean, I'm sure Luke, you've got clients as well, where you take on someone, you put them in a diet and they're like, actually, I kind of like the feeling of getting hungry. I kind of feel like I'm getting leaner or I don't feel like I'm dieting unless I'm doing cardio. They want to feel like a little bit like I'm hungry. I'm a little bit sweaty. And yeah, like you, like you said, Ollie, that kind of feeling of like, okay, this is hard but the scale weight is moving and I feel like I'm getting a return on investment, you know, to a lot of people, they really, really value that. And they might not, if they're doing, like you said, slightly pulled back, like a five out of 10 difficulty, but the scale is barely plodding, plodding along. Do you think that's one of the reasons why people struggle after prep? I think there's a many, there's many reasons that people, <laughs> people struggle after prep. I think the the loss of that goal, um, like, you know, just being in a completely unsustainable body, um, being so obsessed with seeing the scale go down and then mentally having to accept that actually you need to see quite a decent chunk come on quite quickly, I think is where a lot of people struggle. Um, But it's hard for, I think it's hard off the back of, for anyone of any ability, it's hard off the back of a dieting phase. I think almost no matter how difficult your dieting phase is for most people i'm generalizing a little bit so obviously pinch of salt and all that but i'd say the the phase after those initial eight weeks or or four weeks after a dieting phase are almost harder than the diet itself for a lot of people because it's kind of like okay you've done it so what you're you're still a little bit hungry we're starting to kind of unknit what we've done but you're still not fully back to maybe being completely comfortable and now you don't really have that that objective and you've got to pivot and find something else. And hunger now doesn't serve a purpose. I think for a lot of people, that's very difficult to come to terms with. It's like the diet's done. What do you mean I'm still a little bit hungry? What do you mean I can't just like go and eat whatever I want now? What do you mean I, I still have to do a little bit of cardio? Do you know what I mean? You've got to deal with hunger without getting the reward for being hungry. Yeah. Like I always used to talk about the hardest part of a mini cut or like after a mini cut is you wake up starving um depending on how harsh it was obviously i'm talking i'm assuming it's very very harsh you wake up starving you eat your food you go to bed starving and you've gained weight (laughs) and you're like okay cool i've got to like you know you kind of almost i've definitely had that mindset before of like hoping that the scale stalls so that i can have a bit more food um i think it's a very common issue that a lot of people have um ollie is there any kind of uh have you seen that yourself with clients or is is there a kind of go-to um, strategy kind of, I guess, beyond just conversation and expectation setting that you use with a lot of clients in that situation. So again, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that these aren't bodybuilders that I'm training. So my experience isn't other than myself with bodybuilders. It's just photo shoot preps, which are, they're not quite as extreme as that. So we, you know, we don't want extreme levels of hunger and and things with that. Um, but I tend to just, you know, when we transition out of the dieting phase, the focus needs to be relentlessly on performance goals at that point. And if you could, the quicker you can switch your mindset to I'm getting stronger, I'm getting fitter, anything like that, the quicker then you can take that focus off your physique and just whether you've got lines and things like that. Um, And it can be quite a a difficult process. You know, some find it easier than others, but that's not even going as extreme as a, as a, as a prep. I only have my own experience. And then obviously that of other people that I've, seen that have documented their experiences online in terms of a prep but the thing that i noticed that seems to be one of the hardest things to to get around is that when you are deep in a prep and you are hungry all the time the way that you deal with hunger is by telling yourself that hunger is a good feeling because hunger is your body's response to not having enough calories therefore i'm losing body fat so then you think okay well hunger equals good yeah. And then you 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 ride that because that makes it feel easier. Yeah. And by the time you get to the end of a prep, you've solidified in your mind that hunger is a positive feeling. Mm-hmm. And when you come out of prep, then that then means that being full is a negative feeling. Okay. And yeah. then you find that people feel guilty when they aren't hungry. Oh, okay. That's a very interesting point. And then that it's not just a case of, well, there's no reason not, you know, not to eat the pizza or something because you're not prepping. It's actually that it can be really difficult to eat for some people an appropriate amount of food because 
they do feel guilty every time they get that hungry feeling. I, I felt like that to a degree after I'd finished, you know, I, I'd finished my show and I, I had my, my mom had made me some Rocky road. That's the first thing that I had. And then I had a Domino's when I got home and I did have that feeling of, it wasn't like, Oh, thank God for that. It was a, I don't quite like this. I don't like what yeah, yeah. way that I'm feeling right now. And that, that opened my eyes to kind of how easy it can be to fall into a, disordered way of of eating following a bodybuilding show yeah i mean you've, you've spent months doing this goal literally it would have been if, if we're talking about today is the day that you finished the show yesterday you were not allowed those foods are not allowed inverted commas and today you're now having them and the world is your oyster and you can have that and i think that's a good point that there's definitely two um approaches to kind of post prep it's i've missed this food or i don't want to let go of, of this physique i've worked so hard for this physique what do you mean you know, I, I think that's a, a very, very valid point. Um, touching on what you said about um, shifting to performance goals with clients, which are absolutely 100% um, after a dieting phase, that is. Is there anything in which you do um, as a coach to kind of um, incentivize that, such as, here's a few examples, I'm not saying I do this, but here's just a few ideas, like weighing in less, um, looking at physique shots less, maybe trying to stop people, you know, a lot of people like take, post-workout pictures especially as they get leaner maybe discouraging that is there anything kind of along those lines that you particularly do i'm not saying you do those either i'm not saying i do those either i i think as always with this it's it's frustrating because i wish i could just give you an answer but down to the it, client. it literally depends <laughs> on the client you know some people is a case of you know they you know that they'll be obsessed with it or they'd start to demonstrate that they aren't letting go of that so then you might have to say right stop weighing yourself um i think a good way of th that i usually do it is if i can move a lot of the training onto body weight related exercises mm. and i don't necessarily mean that they're, they're weighing themselves for that i mean like things like you know calisthenics like pull up press up sort of exercises because they are things that will inherently be progressive overloaded by them gaining regaining the weight afterwards so that they're currently light so those exercises are going to be some of the easiest that they're going to be and therefore, as they slowly gain weight, then they make progress on those exercises by the fact that they've gained weight. So their only choice to progressively overload those exercises like pull-ups is to gain weight. So it almost softens the fact that they are gaining body mass by the fact that that means that they've made progress on the exercises they're doing in the gym. That's a fantastic approach, mate. That's very, very good. I like that. I might pinch that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think to... something else you like, Jack, that yeah. that Ollie does is Ollie, tell him about your chest press, what you've done on the extreme row. Oh, the well, the prime row, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know the extreme row, yeah. No, it's not it's not an extreme row. It's the upright one, isn't it? I can't remember the name of it. Oh, prime yeah. seated row. It's just a chest supported row, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the problem you've got with the, the prime row is that the, the resistance profile obviously is great because you can manipulate it, but the path of motion of the handles yeah, isn't yeah. because it goes down and up. Mm -hmm. And in an ideal world, you would have like a, a Cybex Eagle row, which goes kind of that way yeah. with the profile of the prime row. So I have kind of got some metal tubing and fixed that um underneath where the kind of pin comes down and stops oh, yeah. so that the so that the handles instead of going like pivoting like that they start upright and they come forwards and down oh, so you start at then, the peak of the arc and they just yeah and then it and it comes down and back but oh, then yeah. the, the problem you had was that then to have the seat the chest pad far enough back in order to get the reach then the chest pad was like right up here yeah so i've then remade a chest pad out of yoga blocks <laughs> and put that lower and at a different angle um is there room on the seat still is that not quite uh it it depends position? it depends how long your arms are so <laughs> you are a little bit perched on the edge if you've got long arms you can just put a bench behind the row and sit on the bench instead because uh, they are roughly the same height on those yeah, yeah, yeah. um but for, for clients that are shorter with shorter arms you're absolutely fine with it they're not going to fall off the back it's not like you're going to fall backwards anyway because you're being pushed against the pad it's like a t-bar row doesn't have a seat mm. so as long as you've got enough to kind of get into position on then that's absolutely fine 
Mate, and what know. I like even more is that it's also a chess press. Oh, I see what you mean. Right, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> I then I then figured out yeah. that if you put daisy chains around the the kind of um, frame of the row okay. and then face the other way, then you end up with a, essentially a cable chess press. Wow. But you can but you can manipulate the resistance profile of the cables. Oh my god. It's so I cool. I that think cool. I think somebody messaged me to say that they'd seen that um Kasim had done that before at N is N1 education. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think they'd seen that he had done that before. Um so I'm not claiming that I invented that. I'm sure some other people have done that before. I just don't follow them. But I didn't see anybody do that. I had the idea on my own. That's really cool, mate. That's that's some good versatility. Um, one thing I, I wanted to quickly touch on before was when you were talking, when I asked you about um, approach to uh, taking people out of diets and you said it depends on the client. That's how you know the mark of a true coach because if you should feel uncomfortable giving a solid answer because a lot of shit depends. And like, I mean how often do if anyone questions your approach for coaching i mean how often do you start off with it depends but if i were to generalize or if i was speaking about you like i hate it whenever people ask me that question because i'd be like i'm going to sound really coachy but i have to say it depends you know yeah absolutely um i i this is the problem with the fitness or one of the problems with the fitness industry that the people who have all the answers aren't the people who have the answers. The people who have the answers <laughs> don't have the answers. <laughs> that's really good. That's incredible. That's really good. And and that's why I struggle to put content out either because I think, oh, this, this is a really good tip for a few clients. Yeah. But then I have to write a massive paragraph to caveat all the, you know, in this context, this isn't helpful. In this context, this isn't helpful. <laughs> like even today on one of my stories, uh, I put on a video of me doing a split squat variation. Mm. And I'm very careful to say that this is my current favorite. Not yeah, that I think this is superior to other, um, because people will take that and think, well, if, if Ollie does it, then it must be the best way of doing that split squat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I do think deeply and and with an attention to detail about the exercises that I do. But that's me currently right now and taking my preference and bias into account. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the case for everyone. I just kind of on that, I Dom in, in the gym has a little bit more of a practical approach than I do. I can get a little bit too far into making everything absolutely perfect when it's only perfect on paper. And I don't actually know that that would produce better results than doing it any other way. Um, he's a lot more, okay, what's the fastest, easiest way with the least amount of equipment that we could get that done in an effective way. And we are different in that way and neither's right or wrong, but we do get clients, you know, some clients ask, you know, how come Ollie does it this way with his clients and you do it this way and vice versa. And our answers are both that we can both have different answers and both be right. Yeah. I think one of the things that you kind of have to learn in, in your early coaching years is that there's, there's very rarely a right or wrong and there's just options and different tools. You know, whenever people like to compare things like, okay, why would Ollie make a chest press out of a prime seated row and not just have a chest press? And it's like, well, there's going to be examples where for that client, that's the best option for what they have, or that's just a preferential option. And sometimes that's the best option. There's also going to be cases where that's just nowhere near the right option for that person. And the more, I'd say the more, the more wealth of knowledge that you have access to, the more topics that you're knowledgeable about, the more tools you have available to kind of find the, the five or 10 things and pick one out that works best. And one thing that I've always uh, kind of, I always talk about is I'm sure Luke's sick to death of me talking about this is pasta versus rice, right? Sometimes there's multiple ways of doing something and it's just, well, I gave you a chest press because we had an exercise slot free and that's what I went for. It doesn't have to be that one. It could be five. There's five or six or seven that would have also worked, but I can't give you five or six or seven different options. I had to pick one, so I pick one, you know? It's like, hey, Jack, why are you eating pasta? Well, right now I want pasta. Why not rice? Well, because I had to pick something, you know? I had to pick one. It's not that one's better than the other. It's just it's what I picked. In At the end of the day, our job is to be helpful to the person that's paying us money. It's not to give them... It's not to be, like, the absolute best right answer. Yeah. So it, where it has to be so right that it takes us two hours to find out and they don't actually get a second. <laughs> 
the ab- <laughs> the absolutism in the industry is fucking crazy. It's wild. I I really love that saying. I don't know who first said it. I I'm sure Paul and uh, James at PT Project probably say that as well. But it's that reminding ourselves that our job is to be helpful, not right. Yeah. So if a if a client kind of has an opinion on something and they disagree with what you know is I'm not saying you you know just accept something that you know to be false, but yeah. let's say you give them an exercise variation that you think is more effective and they tell you that it doesn't feel very good, they are right. 100%. Their, ex- their experience of that supersedes your knowledge. Yeah, 100%. I think you have to be open to, um, I get in that sense, being wrong. You know, you, because it doesn't matter that, you know, what, what you've given them on paper is a bit more length and challenge, and so maybe it's going to give them more growth. If they just don't like it, or they just don't feel it, or, you know, if it's giving them pain or discomfort why would you continue with it you know the evidence is 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 there right in front of you and i think i think to be honest that there's a big difference between people team seem to treat training and food very differently like if you did like a tde calculation of someone but you tracked what they ate and they were vastly different you'd go with the experience of okay well here's what they eat on a daily basis so if i wanted them to maintain here's what it would be but people with training tend to not bear in mind that kind of day-to-day experience of like, oh, I happen to find this bicep variation, I feel the most, and all of the others give me elbow pain. You know, but a coach will still come in and say, make that more lengthened and, you know, take away that that potential enjoyment and pain-free element. Yeah, I, th- I think, I mean, f- my own experience is most decisions around training, especially personal training-wise, are based around injury. Because, you know, like taking the the chest press that I've made out of the prime row, I have a client who has had shoulder surgery and they have been advised, I've been advised by the physio to not load them in that position. And okay, does that mean that we can't train chest or do we just do partials? Well, actually, now we have an option to load that position and still go through the range of motion of the joint, but there's no load in that position. And that solves that issue of, being advised kind of not to do it by the physio. But then if I had the conversation with the physio, it's actually, we have a way of loading that in only the bit that's effective and not the bit that's going to cause any pain or joint forces where we don't want it to be. And then, you know, obviously now, because we have the in-house physio, they're aware of those options. So we kind of, that's again, what my role becomes is yes, physios are very good at diagnosing, doing clinical assessments and, and, things like that but actually the knowledge of how to manipulate the exercises and the equipment isn't there you know they that's not what they train with they they usually give resistance band exercises because they assume that's what the person has access to yeah Yeah, that's a very valid point um i'm aware that we're running out of time so luke is there uh, kind of anything else i don't want to keep you for too long Uh, luke is there anything else that we want to kind of run past ollie before we uh let him get on with something a bit more productive (laughs) <laughs> what do you mean mate? this has been great um the only thing i can think of is ollie where can people find out more about you if anyone listening is in the the area that you're based in what would that be and how do they get in contact so we are in marple which is on the, right on the border between cheshire and greater manchester so we are up north um and the website is www.videfitness.com and there's two Instagram accounts. My personal one is Vide Fitness and the one for the gym is Vide Personal Training. So pretty easy to find. Um, and just wanted to thank you guys for having me on as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I love the evening. Oh, we both matched that. Brilliant. Oh dear. <laughs> See you <laughs> later, bro. Thanks everyone for listening. See you.